Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. Well, thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for the introduction. And uh, thank you to the association for giving me the honour of uh, giving the objective of the memorial lecture. It truly is an honour to do so. Um, <coughs> many of you will be aware, I think all of you will be aware of the uh, problems that have uh, recently been highlighted in terms of self-harm and suicide in young people. Here's uh, one media release from a couple of years ago. Uh, here's another one about self-harm, suggesting that there's been a very major increase in self-harm, uh, particularly in young girls. And then uh, some of you will have uh, seen the releases of uh, the week, uh, uh, week before last, it was, uh, about this paper in the um, in Lancet Psychiatry, um, where uh, data from the Adult Psychiatric Mobility Study was presented over three uh, periods from 2000 up to 2014, suggesting that there had been a massive increase in uh, non-suicidal self-harm. This is using the American sort of uh, definition of uh, NSSI, from 65, 6.5% in 2000 to nearly 20% uh, in 2014 in uh, females. Uh, with a particular increase in, in self-cutting. So what I'd like to do is to talk a bit about the epidemiology and the trends in uh, both, I can talk about both suicide and self-harm. I think it's important to consider both together. Uh, so I'm going to talk about epidemiology and trends uh, in children and adolescents. Uh, say a bit about the onset of uh, self-harm and its timing. Uh, and I'm going to review some of the complexity of factors uh, that contribute to both suicide and self-harm in young people. I'm going to tell you about some new work on the association between self-harm uh, and subsequent suicide. Uh, I'm going to try and address some of the points about prevention and treatment. And finally, I'm going to end by saying a bit about the impact of uh, self-harm in particular on families. Now, firstly, the epidemiology, we find it really useful to think in terms of this iceberg model of, uh, of uh, self-harm and suicide, where you have uh, suicide, obviously, as the uh, worst outcome of uh, uh, self-harming behavior. Uh, and then uh, self-harm, which presents to clinical services, um, I'll be particularly referring to hospital services. And then it's called the iceberg model because of this huge amount of uh, relatively hidden self-harm uh, that's occurring occurs in the community, um, in, in young people, uh, much of which does not come to clinical attention. Um, our estimates would be somewhere between one in eight and one in 10 cases come to clinical attention. Uh, although, of course, families, uh, friends may be aware of the self-harm in uh, many cases. Um, in terms of suicide, so taking the, the peak of the iceberg, globally, uh, this is a, these are somewhat old data from uh, Patton's group, but um, the, the, the latest we had, um, it's the second most common cause of death um, in 15 to 19 year olds after road traffic accidents. Interestingly, in females, it's the most common cause of death, although numerically uh, it's much less common in females than in males, but uh, males have a much higher incidence of road traffic accidents and uh, other violent causes of death, and so that pushes it down to the third most common cause in uh, males. Um, what about uh, trends in, in uh, suicide? Um, these are national data for uh, England from the Office of National Statistics from 2000 up to 2017. Uh, males are shown in red, females in blue, and a darker blue for the overall uh, trend. You can see that they follow a relatively similar pattern. If we look at the recent period, since 2010, 2011, you'll see there's been a very major increase in 
uh, suicide in males and in the uh, females. Although interestingly, if we track back to the beginning of the century, we actually had high uh, rates at that, relatively high rates at that time. Um, now the pattern is that we're almost back to the what perhaps slightly uh, what equivalent rates uh, of suicide in uh, 12 to 19 year olds as we had at the beginning of the century, but of course we've got this upward trend, uh, and indeed the females have uh, overtaken the rates that they uh, had at the uh, beginning of the century. Um, turning to self harm, just to clarify what we mean by self harm. Um, and this is the definition we use, intentional, non-fatal poisoning, self-poisoning or self-injury, irrespective of the degree of suicidal intent or even absent, absence of suicidal intent, or the nature of other types of motives that are showing distress, uh, trying to be with a, a distressed state of mind and so on. So it include overdoses, self-cutting, attempted hanging, uh, jumping, etc. And um, in terms of national trends, these are data um, from a, the Bristol group uh, looking at hospital and primary care data. Um, a male, or males uh, here, females here. And you can see that the main change that's happened has been this massive increase, a doubling in the incidence of uh, self-harm uh, in girls aged 13 to 16. <coughs> Um, little shift in, in, in the other um, uh, patterns, although possibly a little bit of an increase in the, in the uh, very, very young. Um, so there's something going on in the teenage years uh, that's reflected in an increase in self-harm, uh, as I showed you in that media release at the beginning, uh, particularly in girls and uh, in, in uh, younger teenagers, and also an increase in uh, suicide rates. So going back to the iceberg model, we tried to put numbers to the uh, compartments of this model uh, a couple of years ago. Actually, these were da data from 2011 to, uh, to 13. So these are annual numbers, uh, estimated numbers, um, or the accurate numbers for suicides. The suicide data came from the Office for National Statistics, <coughs> the hospital presenting self-harm, Estimates came from our multi center study of self harm in England, uh, and the community self harm figures came from a school survey conducted in a large scale school survey in Gloucestershire. And, um, and you can see th these numbers now would be quite a lot higher um, for suicides, but you can see the gender ratio uh, over two to one, male to female, uh, whereas for self harm it's, all, it's very much reversed. The hospital presenting self harm, we estimated over 20,000 uh, individuals um, in the 12 to 17 age range presenting with self harm to hospital uh, each year uh, with a 4 to 1 gender ratio. Uh, for community self harm, this figure would be a considerable <coughs> underestimate um, because it was based on young people saying, Yes, I self harmed in the last year and giving a description of what they did, they did, and in fitting our criteria. And very often, even those who said they'd self-harmed said they didn't give a, uh, a description of what they've done. So this would be a, uh, an underestimate, but it, uh, it shows, again, the very high uh, female to uh, male ratio. So, I mean, what these numbers uh, obviously illustrate is that we clearly need preventive interventions and most people look to, to schools uh, for this and I'll say a bit more about this later uh, and possibly uh, online uh, into preventive interventions and of course it's uh, uh, obvious to say uh, the need for good quality uh, hospital uh, space clinical services and community uh, treatment services to young people self-harm. So I'd like to say a little bit about the onset of self-harm. Um, these are again data from our multi-centre study for self-harm in England, based on data from Oxford, Manchester and Derby. And um, these show, this shows the number of individuals uh, by gender and individual years of age from 10 upwards to 18 
females in red uh, in this slide. Um, and you can see that things take off around age 12, um, and the gender ratio then is very high in terms of female to male, four to one, and gets even higher up to six to one at age 14, and then gradually decreases as the males start to catch up uh, with the uh, numbers of uh, female couples they never uh, do catch up with the teenage uh, years. Um, there's been some interesting work done about on the relationship to puberty and uh, the onset of self-harm. Uh, this slide shows, um, they summarize the data from a study from Patton again, um, which is a school based on school surveys in Australia and uh, American, America, um, looking at um, well over 3,000 uh, school students, school pupils, and they use the Tanner scale to look at the association between uh, risk of self-harm and uh, pubertal stage. And what this shows quite clearly is a very strong association between uh, late or completed uh, puberty and the onset or the risk of uh, uh, self-harm with, with a sort of titration effect through the uh, phases of uh, uh, puberty. And they found that the association uh, with pubertal stage was particularly strong in girls and also for uh, self-cutting and other independent factors that were associated with risk of self-harm were depression, alcohol use and the onset of sexual activity. Um, there's some recent work um, uh, not yet published uh, from the Ausback study uh, showing that uh, the risk of self-harm increases the earlier the onset of puberty. Um, so there's, there's some very interesting uh, findings around the uh, relationship of uh, puberty to uh, the beginning of uh, self-harming behaviour. We've been doing some work, some unpublished work, um, looking at uh, self-harm in very in young young children. Um, <clears throat> again, these are data from our multi-centre study of self-harm, uh, and this basically shows the numbers of individuals. Um, the, the numbers are relatively small when you consider we're looking at a 14-year uh, study period here. Uh, males are shown in black. I think the interesting thing is that the gender ratio is the opposite way in the very younger, uh, in the younger children who are self-harming. Uh, and then at age 11, it sort of uh, reaches parity, and then you have this sudden uh, increase at age 12 in uh, girls um, self-harming. The, um, the other, one of the other important findings here was there was a relatively high incidence in both genders, but particularly boys, of self-injury in the very young uh, age group, uh, and including particularly um, uh, attempts in hanging and suffocation, which are obviously uh, uh, dangerous, uh, particularly dangerous uh, uh, methods. Okay, I'd now like to review some of the uh, complexity of findings that are uh, associated with or contribute to uh, self-harm and uh, uh, suicide in, in, in children and adolescents. Um, uh, and I'll go through these fairly rapidly because there's a, a wide range of factors uh, that have been shown to be associated, not all necessarily causal, uh, with self-harm and suicide. One is socioeconomic deprivation. We know that rates of self-harm in children and adolescents are higher in those who live in areas of relative uh, socioeconomic uh, deprivation. And also there's association with uh, poor uh, educational achievement. And then of course there are all the family history uh, and adversity uh, factors which uh, are well known to be associated with both self-harm and suicide, parental separation, divorce, parental death, family history of suicidal behaviour, um, which seems to act beyond just um, transmission of psychiatric disorder, um, uh, but also parental men mental disorder, uh, where there's a um, problematic parental relationship, uh, and then, of course, uh, as 
you well know and we'll be hearing more about I think today, adverse child experience, childhood experiences, uh, physical or sexual abuse, um, uh, bullying, uh, and of course interpersonal difficulties. In younger adolescents, it's mostly about family relationship problems. In older adolescents, it's often these personal difficulties are often with uh, boyfriends and girlfriends. Um, and then, of course, there's the whole question about mental disorder um, as part of the uh, contributory picture. Um, we did a psychological autopsy study uh, some years ago of, of young people who died by suicide, uh, and we found something over 80% had evidence of psychiatric disorders this is based on interviews with families, clinical records, uh, etc. Uh, and we also did a systematic review a few years ago of studies of using research diagnostic criteria of young people who pre presented uh, to clinical services with self-harm. I think we found nine uh, studies in children and adolescents. And the figures were very similar, uh, around about 80% uh, just over 80% with evidence of uh, psychiatric disorder, of course, particularly depression, uh, anxiety, including PTSD, uh, ADHD. Um, in both of these studies, autism spectrum disorder was, well, wasn't examined, so that's missing from, the, from these uh, data. We know that that's another important association. Um, drug and alcohol uh, misuse. Uh, alcohol misuse is probably the more important factor uh, contributing to uh, both self-harm and uh, suicide, particularly in older adolescents. And then, of course, the emergent um, borderline uh, personality traits, um, uh, again, you know, uh, well associated with uh, self-harm, uh, particularly re repetition of, uh, multiple repetition of self-harm. Uh, and then there's a the question of impulsivity. I mean, we talk a lot about people being impulsive. I think uh, it's often a, a, a misleading term. I think it's often that uh, people, individuals have difficulty solving problems they're facing and do something just to lower their arousal um, rather than always being people who respond rapidly to things. But uh, certainly in association with impulsivity, as you'd expect with the uh, Figures for depression, which we found in 50% of those uh, in our, uh, our um, uh, psychological autopsy study, uh, low self esteem, uh, hopelessness. Some evidence that poor problem, problem solving skills may increase risk of uh, self harm. Uh, and a lot of interest lately in the role of perfectionism, particularly, uh, Stephen mentioned university student suicides uh, and to, to the to what extent we identically know, but uh, it's often said that perfectionism may be a contributing factor in that uh, group. Lately, a lot of interest in the role of uh, sleep disorders in self harm. Here's one illustration this is a uh, study from the uh, USA of a community mood disorders clinic uh, in which uh, over 211 to 19 year, year olds who were attending this clinic were examined. Uh, and 65% of them had uh, severe nightly um, uh, sleep problems, and half of them had a history of non suicidal mm -hmm. self injury using the American uh, definition, 30% suicide attempts, obviously, quite a lot of them did both. Uh, and what that was found in this study was that severe sleep disturbance was associated with more frequent self harm, suicide attempts, and uh, suicidal ideation. And of course, there's the important um, uh, influence of uh, social media and the use of uh, uh, mobile phones uh, on sleep. Uh, a UK study indicated that almost half of teenagers were checking their mobile phones during the night, uh, and it's a worrying, very worrying figure of one in ten checking them at least ten times a night which obviously doesn't help with uh, uh, sleep or other, or other problems and may be adding to the uh, uh, distress in, in young people contributing to uh, self-harm. Um, also interest recently in mood instability, which we, by which we mean 
where there's, there's rapid uh, changes in affect um, with difficulty in controlling these and particularly controlling their behavioral uh, consequences. Uh, and in another American study of uh, 250 um, uh, young males and, and females aged 18, mood instability identified at age 18 uh, was found to predict uh, personality, borderline personality disorder, including uh, self-harm, repetition of self-harm at age uh, uh, 20. We know that um, contagion uh, of self-harming behavior uh, can be a particular problem in, uh, in young people. Um, we know that exposure to friends uh, and self-harming can be an important risk factor in a, uh, a schools-based study we did some years ago. We found this was particularly true in girls and for self-cutting. Um, we know that also clustering of uh, self-harm and suicide uh, occurs in young people much more commonly than uh, in adults. And also that uh, media influences on uh, self-harm and suicide are particularly strong in young people. And um, many of you will remember the um, sad uh, story of uh, the cluster, the a large number of suicides that occurred in young people in Bridge End uh, just over 10 years ago. And here's some of the awful <coughs> newspaper reporting uh, of those uh, events, uh, including uh, on front page headlines, uh, photo galleries, photos of the young people who died, uh, the method of suicide mentioned in the title, uh, and indeed, in the text, there was much more detail about the particular method this uh, girl, in this case, used for uh, uh, suicide. And we know that those sorts of the way suicide is reported uh, can have an influence on the likelihood of subsequent suicide. Some very elegant work from Madeleine Gould in the USA uh, a few years ago showed this uh, uh, quite uh, uh, clearly. Um, uh, and then, of course, there's the whole problem of um, uh, internet sites uh, which may uh, portray uh, methods of self-harm. Uh, the next slide I'm going to show, some people would say, <coughs> triggering for people at risk of self-harm. So I we even want to look, close your eyes for a moment. Uh, but so this sort of picture uh, on, uh, you know, is easily accessible uh, on the internet. Um, we did a uh, review uh, a couple of years ago, uh, it was published last year, looking at what evidence there was regarding uh, internet sites uh, and uh, self-harm. Um, and the evidence from the studies, uh, the specific studies we were able to look at all together, showed that first of all, young people often accessed uh, internet sites related to self-harm prior to harming themselves. Um, that pro-suicide sites, in other words, sites which tend to uh, encourage self-harming behavior or even suicide, are very easy to access. Uh, that detailed methods of uh, self-harm and suicide are very easily available. Uh, in terms of, there's a lot of discussion about social networking sites. Do these contribute to self-harm? Well, the, the evidence we found from studies seem to be, go both ways, suggesting that some people found that um, it was, was self-harming found them useful. Other, uh, in other uh, cases, there was evidence they may have uh, uh, actually contributed to uh, self-harm. And then there's the issue of cyberbullying, um, um, online uh, bullying. Uh, and of course, the problem with this is it can happen 24 hours a day, the person can be alone uh, and uh, would be being bullied by and by uh, peers. Uh, and again, um, we did a review with Anne John's group in Wales of the uh, impact of cyberbullying or being cyberbullied on risk of self-harm. And this is just summarizing all the studies. And basically, there was a, a doubling of the risk of uh, self-harm in those who were being cyberbullied although it was very difficult to distinguish cyberbullying from face-to-face -face bullying as well, because often people were experiencing both. Interestingly, uh, the um, people who were actually doing the bullying 
also had an increased risk of uh, 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 self harm. <coughs> what about factors that may be protective, protective against self harm? Well, not, we don't have a lot. We can obviously look at the inverse of all the risk factors, but that's not very uh, helpful. Um, but these are the uh, findings, as I'm aware of them. Firstly, the social connectedness, the sense of being uh, part of a peer group, being attached to peers, um, maybe uh, protective, uh, feeling part of the school community, uh, maybe protective, and limited evidence that um, more adaptive problem-solving skills may be uh, uh, protective. So I'd like to turn now to the uh, issue of suicide following self-harm. Um, and I'm going to refer to data from our multi-centre study uh, where data are collected in on self-harm in Oxford, uh, Manchester and Derby. This is the uh, website for our uh, group. Um, and I'm going to read, this is again is unpublished uh, data. Uh, it's the follow-up study we've, we've done of over 9,000 uh, 10 to 18 year olds who presented to hospital between 2000 and 2013, the so 14 year period, uh, followed up for uh, death, which everybody's flagged in our uh, uh, multi study for uh, death anywhere in the UK. Um, so we got data from ONS uh, for any deaths that occurred up to the end of 2015. And um, this is the uh, the methods used for self-harm at first presentation in these over 9,000 individuals, the majority, over three quarters, self-poisoning, uh, particularly uh, common in the uh, females, uh, self-injury more common in the males, uh, and with a small group that uh, use both self-poisoning and self-injury in the same episodes. And um, what we found at the uh, end of 2015 was that 124 individuals had died, um, nearly 45% of the deaths were suicides, um, just over one in five were uh, recorded as accidental deaths, although one or two of these may have been possible suicides, particularly where there was accidental, uh, recorded accidental poisoning with psychotropic drugs, uh, and then uh, just over a, a third with uh, deaths from other causes, na natural causes. In other words, mainly. So, focusing on the suicides, the 55 uh, individuals who died by suicide, um, these are the methods uh, involved in their actual deaths. And you can see a very different pattern to what I showed you in terms of uh, methods at the time of uh, self harm presentation, with 45 of them, of the 55 involving uh, uh, self injury, uh, and self injury being particularly common in the uh, males who uh, died by suicide. So there was major me method switching from uh, self-harm to suicide. And this shows the switching methods from the last episode of self-harm in those who repeated, or the first episode in those who didn't, to, uh, to uh, suicide. You can see big switch from self-poisoning to self-injury, uh, particularly hanging and asphyxiation. Uh, the large number of 12 out of the 17 who self-injured uh, use self-injury in, uh, in their suicide, although some switched to self-poisoning, interestingly, and all of those before that uh, had used both methods in, in their last episode of self-harm died by self-injury. So it was major method switching, and particularly a uh, switch to uh, hanging and uh, asphyxiation um, with 57% who died using this method. Um, one of the interesting things about doing a, a long-term follow-up is you can look at the uh, deaths that occur well after the uh, incidents of uh, self-harm. Uh, and what this shows is that the vast majority, three quarters of the deaths, um, occurred after age 18. So, um, in those 10 to 15, uh, four out of the 11 who died uh, were in, in this age range. Uh, though, of those 16 to 18, just nine out of 44 were in this age range. The vast majority of the deaths were very uh, much uh, were occurring later on. So just to summarize that, 
nearly half the deaths uh, in this study were due to suicide. Over half of them involved pain or asphyxiation with uh, uh, evidence of method switching. Uh, the majority of the suicides occurred in adulthood. And indeed, what we found is that the risk seemed to be maintained over time, whereas in adults you see a, uh, a rapid drop off in risk after the first year. Uh, we, there was a, a pretty strong indication that risk of suicide, although much lower than in adults, was maintained over time. Uh, and uh, importantly, uh, there was an, uh, an association of increased risk with uh, where self-injury occurred, and no difference in risk of suicide where the last method of self-harm had been self-cutting uh, or, or overdose. And that's contrary to what a lot of clinicians uh, believe and an important finding. Okay, preventative prevention and treatment. Um, uh, one uh, approach has been gatekeeper training, uh, training of school teachers to recognize youngsters at risk. Um, I think the evidence of effectiveness of this is not strong. It doesn't mean that it doesn't work. I think just the evidence is, is, is not strong. Screening uh, was very popular in the USA. This is where individuals completed questionnaires, and those who scored above a certain cutoff were then interviewed uh, uh, clinically um, in terms of uh, whether they were potentially at risk. This has now been dropped largely because it wasn't that effective, and one problem was uh, young people being screened, screened negative, and dying subsequently by suicide, resulting in legal uh, action by parents against schools. So that has now been dropped. But much more positive have been the results of school educational pro uh, programs. Uh, here's one, which is the uh, Saving and Empowering Young Lives in Europe study, or the SALI uh, project, in which um, uh, there was um, uh, training in mental health awareness for school pupils, uh, uh, role play, um, uh, working in groups, uh, booklets about uh, mental health, um, and uh, also training on the sort of whole school approach to uh, prevention. And uh, in, a, in a study involving 10 countries um, and a very large number of schools, uh, there was evidence that this was associated, this program was associated with an actual reduction in risk of uh, subsequent self-harm. It wasn't conducted in this country, unfortunately, uh, and I do think it needs um, uh, verification in a in further, further work. But at least there is something positive uh, there. And there are other programs that have been shown to, uh, shown encouraging results. Always when we're thinking about prevention, we should be thinking about restriction of access to means. The best evidence uh, of impacts on suicide in particular come from uh, changes in availability of particular means for suicide. In this country, one would think about smaller packs of uh, paracetamol, which seem to be important, although they are not being uh, followed in all outlets. Um, some outlets are uh, offering large amounts of, relatively large amounts of paracetamol relatively cheaply. Um, uh, and then there's the question of what interventions work following self-harm. Well, we did a Cochrane review uh, some years ago, uh, three years ago, which is, um, uh, uh, and we've added uh, some study or adding some studies to this. In terms of um, therapies where there are more than one trial showing evidence of efficacy, these are randomized trials, then the best evidence comes for uh, dialectical behavior therapy. Um, and we found th uh, three trials uh, where, when there's a comparison with treatment as usual, um, DBT was shown to have benefits in terms of reducing frequency of self-harm uh, and also reducing uh, reductions in depression, hopelessness, and suicidal ideation. There are some single trials which uh, uh, offer encouragement. Um, Dennis Ugrins, who's here, uh, his therapeutic assessment approach uh, seemed to offer positive uh, results, particularly in terms of engagement in therapy. 
uh, and there's some evidence that mentalization uh, may be uh, uh, beneficial in terms of reducing repetition of self harm. Yeah. But not a lot to go on um, relative to the situation in adults. Um, obviously, we need to do uh, work to try and tackle problems in media reporting. Things have greatly improved in this country in terms of uh, newspaper reporting and other media reporting and portrayal. And I think the Samaritans in particular have done a fantastic job with the media guidelines and also their monitoring and feedback uh, where there's uh, poor, poor reporting or portrayal of suicidal behaviour. But every now and again uh, we get a bad, bad example. There have been some recently in relation to uh, university student suicides. Um, the government is very committed to tackling um, internet uh, uh, um, issues, uh, particularly websites which uh, uh, seem to encourage uh, self-harm, uh, and that is important. The problem is one can really only tackle websites originating in this country, um, and of course that's not always the case. Um, uh, and then there's the question of whether internet uh, uh, web-based interventions are going to be effective. There's a lot of work going on on uh, uh, internet-based interventions, uh, but we still need to see the uh, positive results from these. At the moment, I don't think there's good evidence of effectiveness. It doesn't mean they don't work, of course. Uh, we're just waiting for better evidence to accumulate. So I'd like to end by saying a bit about the impact of uh, uh, self-harm on uh, families. Um, and I'm going to refer to a, a study we did a few years ago, which was a qualitative uh, uh, interview study um, with 37 parents of young people who were uh, self-harming, um, mostly mothers, as in so often, as many of you will be aware, it's very difficult to recruit fathers for uh, studies like this, uh, and we found, uh, we, we found the same and we've just had five fathers. But we did have a range of participants from across the UK, uh, very poor uh, ethnic minority representation as well, although we did uh, try to uh, specifically target ethnic minority <coughs> parents. Uh, and in terms of the uh, young people who have been self-harming, the sons or daughters, uh, they've used a range of self-harm methods. They would tend to be towards the more severe end in the uh, a lot of them were in uh, psychiatric or had been in uh, psychiatric care. Um, so I'm going to show you um, uh, um, some clips from uh, a health talk uh, website that we developed based on the thematic analysis of these uh, interviews. Uh, so I've just got six six minutes of uh, clips to uh, uh, show you of these. My daughter's 17 now, and uh, when she was 13, one of her friends um, told her dad that she'd been cutting herself with um, glass, uh, that she'd been collecting somehow. And um, uh, she said that she, said that she knew, um, she said that she told my daughter she was going to tell us. Um, and oh, she tried to persuade her not to, but her friend, being but you know, a very sensible girl, and obviously caring about her, said, so, no, I'm going to tell them because it's the right thing to do. First feeling was my stomach dropped, and I felt sick, and I thought, oh no, it's really that bad. What's, what's happened that's that bad? Why has she felt the need to do this? What have I done? Um, why didn't I know sooner? Why couldn't she come to me? Why couldn't she talk about it? What could I have done to make things different so that she hadn't felt the need? Total lack of control. Total lack of understanding. Um, like most parents, you go for life going, don't worry, everything will be all right. Don't worry, I'll look after that. I'll sort that out and suddenly you can't. Mm -hmm. at, I mean, at some stage, I can't remember how old she was, but I do remember she explained it very coherently. If your head is hurting with emotional pain, if you're unhappy, if you're really, really hurting so badly in your head to harm yourself on your skin, to give yourself other pain, stops the feelings in your head. 
I mean, what, I mean, she's always been very coherent at explaining the things that she's done. And, and I could, even though I can't really understand why anyone would do that, I understood that. It's deferring that pain away. I've since found, found out it is a lot more common than what we think it is. And uh, speaking to the community mental health nurse, she says she's just inundated with children that are self-harming. And it's almost as if it's a bit of a craze. But in my daughter's case, it was it was not a craze. This was to help her overcome or get through the trauma that she'd been through. So there's to me, there seems like there's two forms of self harm. There is this craze going around, but there is also the very disturbed who are using it just to get through. Do you tell people? Do you keep it quiet? Who do you tell? Um, do you feel embarrassed? Do you feel humiliated? Do you feel, what do you feel? What do you say to people when they say they haven't seen your daughter for a while? I mean, there are all these things. It's, you kind of like, you're skating on ice. You don't know how to be. I think it, um, being female, it helps me to talk. Men are not so good at talking, um, on the whole, that's a generalisation, but, uh, and I think that's one of the things that's so difficult for my son because his father was very much, you know, men don't cry and men don't this, whereas I've always enforced in him, or reinforced, whatever the word is, actually it takes more of a man to cry. Um, and he does at times. The important thing is finding reliable, researched information. It's very easy to, to look for anything and get onto a website that's got a forum that is just people chit-chatting and spreading their opinions. It's much more difficult to find somewhere that has got researched knowledge and background, as well as people talking and talking about their experiences. Clinician, listen to the parents, please, please, please. Uh, nobody has spoken to us enough. We're the ones that know about our children and we're the ones that can help you to help our children so please talk to us more because sometimes our children won't talk to you but we can tell you a lot more especially about their background about when they were younger more needs to be found out about the person you're treating through the parent and it's not don't ever be ashamed of a man what you're going through because I'll guarantee you there's about 50 other folk out there in the same boat. And if by doing this I can at least help one person raise awareness or help them understand better or help them to acknowledge what's going on, then I'll be happy. Yeah, I think also looking after yourself, looking after your own sort of mental and physical health is really, really important. And I sought help um, myself and had some, had some counselling. And I think you have to take a long, longish term view of this. You can't rush them to stop it immediately, which is what you'd like to do, what I wanted to do in the beginning. Um, you can't despair of them and turn your back on them. I think you have to find a way together um, to talk about things, to find out their triggers for it, to try and reduce it, uh, to take a longer term view, um, and to keep keep you know hopeful and supporting them and, and, and until they no longer need it. I would just say to people to remain hopeful. It might be a long, long journey, and it might be the times where that your terror and your fear is going to completely overwhelm you. But just remain hopeful, remain strong, and realise that nothing stays the same. Okay, um, so those are just some extracts from the um, from from the website, which you can uh, find online. That's the uh, healthtalk.org uh, uh, website. Just a, a quick summary of the key findings that. Um, parents uh, tended to react to their discovering their child's self-harm with confusion, disbelief, um, but it also often had very negative effects on the uh, parents' emotional state. Um, 
um, several of them actually uh, we had treatment themselves for mental health problems following uh, discovery of the self-harm. And often there were financial issues, particularly where young people had to be transported uh, for, for aftercare or where parents had to travel long distances uh, where um, uh, their son or daughter might be in inpatient care. There were major impacts on parenting, uh, including not just the young person self-harming, but impacts on uh, parenting of si siblings and often impacts on the wider family, including marital relationships. And social isolation um, was uh, an issue for some parents, particularly because of them perceiving the <coughs> stigma associated with self-harm, not wanting to talk to others about it. Um, as I said, parenting strategies were often affected, uh, and they clearly considered the uh, attitude of clinicians to be important. Uh, and there were particular comments about not wanting clinicians who were assessing their uh, son and daughter to be, to be using, or the young people were saying to them they didn't want them using a tick box approach to assessment, uh, but really active listening uh, to them. Uh, that they wanted, as you can see from uh, a couple of the comments here, to be involved in uh, a treatment, and they considered that, uh, again, as you have heard, the practical uh, information through resources and uh, also guidance were considered important. And as a result of this, we developed, uh, first of all, the, uh, the Health Talk website, where there's about 240 uh, video, uh, mostly video, uh, extracts arranged thematically around all the issues relating to young people's self-harm. Uh, and then together with the uh, Charlie Waller Trust, we produced a uh, guide for parents and carers, uh, which is available both freely online and in hard copy from the Charlie Waller Trust. I think at the last count, 48,000 copies have been distributed uh, of that. Uh, and more recently, we produced this guide for uh, school staff also available from the Charlie Royal Trust. And both of these, there's copies, some copies upstairs uh, in the coffee area on the Charlie Waller Memorial Trust uh, desk that people can look at. And lastly, we produced a summary of our findings for uh, clinical staff. So just to summarize uh, what I've said, um, there's clear evidence of the increased rates of uh, suicide in, in teenagers. Uh, a very worrying upward trend in, in rates of suicide, but also a uh, particular increase in self-harm in uh, young adolescent girls. Much self-harm, uh, as illustrated from the iceberg model, doesn't come to uh, clinical attention. Uh, a very wide range of factors can contribute to self-harm. Um, it's truly multi-factorial. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all uh, listed, listed them there. <coughs> Um, and obviously, when thinking about intervention and therapy, one needs to uh, consider what, uh, what uh, is important in uh, individual cases. Uh, there's an important association between self-harm and uh, subsequent suicide, often including a change in uh, method of suicide with the risk uh, of extending well into uh, young adulthood. Uh, and um, as I said, because of the highly multifactorial nature of self-harm suicide, a wide range of uh, therapeutic and uh, preventive measures are required. Although at the moment, the, the evidence about what really works is still uh, sadly rather limited. Um, and the prevention of self-harm suicide uh, clearly prevents in, in the young people presents a major challenge uh, with school-based and possibly, hopefully, internet-based approaches probably being the uh, best option. And lastly, the impact of uh, self-harm and course, suicide on families is extremely substantial and must be addressed in terms of uh, uh, management of uh, young people who are self-harming. So thanks very much for your attention. for a fantastically comprehensive talk, uh, really putting the field in context and showing this very moving uh, 
videos of the parents, it's often a difficulty I find for some young people don't want to involve their parents, but all the surveys really parents do want to be involved. These are their children. Uh, thank you. So we've got 10 minutes which we'd like to start. Uh, there are some people running around with microphones. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I wondered if... Um, Can you say who you are? Oh, Marianne Lentoven. Um, I wonder if you could say something about self-harm and eating disorders. Uh, well, we know that, yes, I mean, there's uh, uh, certainly a strong association between uh, self-harm and uh, um, both anorexia and uh, uh, bulimia, um, talking about specific disorders. Uh, and of course, the, uh, it, it's well recognized that the highest risk for uh, suicide in any psychiatric disorder is uh, with uh, anorexia, uh, anorexia. So, uh, yes, a major uh, association there. Um, in, in bulimia, um, repetitive self-harm, uh, self-mutilation is, is often a, a common, uh, common part of the picture. Um, somebody was asking me last night about the nature of the association. Why is it that there is this uh, association? I think um, often it's about uh, uh, self-control and breakthrough from self-control um, for both binges and, and self-cutting uh, or other, other self-harm. Um, but of course, um, uh, self-harm itself may, may also provide, well, I think often the motive is, is self-punishment, uh, reflecting in a dislike of the self, body image and so on. Uh, and and uh, that's often, I think, the motive for uh, uh, self-mutilation or self-cutting in, in uh, uh, eating disorders. Although it may also be about tension, tension release. Um, Hello. Thank you Sorry, can you just wait a second? Thank you very much. Um, I have a few questions, but the first one would be, or the main one would be, around um, your opinion on the use of safety planning with young people after self-harm. I know there's a lot of enthusiasm about it, but whether there's a research base and well, uh, no, so, so, so I think what, we, what we're seeing both in um, adults uh, and uh, in, in clinical practice with adults and young people is a move away from this idea of risk assessment. I mean, we, there's numerous studies which now show we cannot identify individuals who are specifically at risk. And we should stop kidding ourselves that we can do that although trusts very much still want us to do it. I think it's often about protecting trust rather than patients from that kind of issue. Um, uh, and uh, a move to where to, towards thinking, well, any individuals who've got, or any group of individuals with psychiatric disorders will have an increased risk of self-harm and suicide. It's just that we can't identify the, if you like, in the haystack. So we need to be thinking about safety planning in all uh, individuals, and uh, I think it's a really positive move, um, uh, as long as management can, can go along with it, uh, by, by trust management that is. Um, and uh, I, the evidence is not strong, there, there's some evidence from a trial in the US in adults uh, that safety planning in youngsters, was, uh, sorry, in individuals who are self-harming seem to have uh, beneficial effects. There's a lot of work going on here at the moment, both in adults and in young people, uh, but I think the, we're waiting for, for the evidence. But I, I, I can't help but feel it's a positive way, uh, way forward. So this is where you develop a safety plan with the individual about what they do, will do if they get into another crisis, uh, about their personal resources they can use, who they can turn to, and so on and so forth. Uh, plus, plus other aspects in terms of uh, restriction of access to, to thinking about access to methods of self-harm and suicide, uh, sharing of information, it's a controversial area, but with, with uh, families, uh, uh, and having a clear um, communication with, with clinicians, families, and, and the individual involved. So I think it's a really positive way for you. Hello. Oh, 
<laughs> and I just wanted to Can you say who you are? Oh, sorry, uh, my name is Lola. I just wanted to see if the, there was any research indicating why there's a strong link between early puberty and early self-harm. I was just wondering if there's prevalence of disorders like premenstrual dysphoric disorder or something that might be causing that early prevalence of it. Well, that's an interesting question. I think we're still out, I mean, out, uh, we still don't know specifically why there's this with this association, um, uh, but we do know from other evidence that menstrual disturbances can be, uh, obviously females can be associated with, uh, with the increased risk of self-harm, but I think, uh, I think we're quite a long way from understanding really why there's this, this uh, particular association, uh, but I think it really is an important topic clinically um, uh, to, to be aware of. But sorry, I don't. Uh, maybe someone else here does. Hello, Claire Stafford for the Charlie Ward Trust. Thank you for that. It was excellent. Um, you mentioned poverty and deprivation. Certainly, in our work, we're hearing very clearly from schools that they feel they're they're picking up on all the deficits in community services, youth services social services. The other factor that keeps coming up uh, regularly is the exam system, the education system and the crushing pressure of exams earlier more. Uh, maybe there's a link with perfectionism and I just wondered if you'd observed at all whether that is a factor, maybe particularly amongst uh, young, young girls who tend to be a little bit more uh, conscientious about that and may then have self-harming behaviour as a result. Well, certainly in, in the um, study, I think I just touched, touched on early on about um, uh, problems uh, young people were facing preceding their self-harm. Study problems came out with two, second or third after interpersonal uh, difficulties. Um, what we don't have from that, I mean, those data are fairly crude in the sense of, just know they had were identified as having study problems. We don't know the nature of those, those problems in, in this study. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. he's looking at uh, uh, more. But as you say, Claire, the, um, in young, young, the younger girls, it was a particular high, high issue. So uh, I agree. You know, it's a, it is an important contributing factor. Yeah. Thank you. Um, sorry, just here. Um, I'm Annie Willits from uh, T's Eskimo Valley in NHS Trust. I just wondered if you had any thoughts about the um, management of self-harm within an open inpatient setting, um, obviously with the competing sort of demand for trying to get young people out of hospital fairly quickly, but then obviously the ever-increasing demand of keeping people safe and restrictions on, you know, restricting access to means, etc. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm here I need to make a confession. I'm not a child or adolescent psychiatrist. <laughs> so I'm uh, a suicide researcher, and that's it, a self harm and suicide researcher. But, um, I mean, yeah, it is a difficult dilemma, isn't it? Because we know that um, in institutional settings, particularly uh, inpatient settings, the risk of contagion around self harm is particularly strong. Uh, and, uh, you know, can cause uh, a major sort of uh, distress of the poor staff uh, and, and so on, and that ideally you want to take individuals out of that more contagious environment. But um, uh, I mean, striking the balance between you know safety and uh, uh, what might be seen as uh, desirable intervention, I think is is, is often a very uh, a very difficult one. And um, as we know, in in, in this. I was going to say game, it's a wrong word for clinical practice, but you know, taking risks is, is, is what we're doing all, every day. Um, I, I mean, I think uh, one's preference should be towards working with young people in the community, uh, if, at all, uh, if at all possible, and um, really keeping inpatient care uh, down, to, down to a minimum. But, uh, it is a really, really difficult balance. Um, you know, to, to I'm sure some clinicians in the audience will probably be able to answer this much more fully than I can. But 
I, I, I agree that the balance there is, is really tough. Right, last question. Um, Isabel Heyman, thank you for a wonderful review. My, my question is actually sort of related, which one of the things that came over most strongly to me was this mismatch between knowing what's happening and knowing what to do about it. And in some settings, for example, in the liaison, child and adolescent mental health, almost all resource is being used up on trying to keep on top of this problem because the ultimate outcome is so devastating. And I just wondered if you had something to say, you know, broadly about the direction of travel as how services go about organising what they do about this in terms of how much resource to, to put into this problem because, the, you know, the perceived risk is so great and people are so risk averse, yet what we can actually do and know what to do is so limited. So the temptation is to do absolutely everything you can, but that means one can end up not being able to do much else. Well, I mean, certainly in terms of where, where you know, young people are actually self-harming, clearly we've got to put resources into good quality psychosocial or biopsychosocial, to use the current term, assessment to make sure we fully you know, understand as well as possible what's going on, uh, develop some sort of relationship with the other people, to, uh, and then to identify what potentially might be uh, therapeutic, including obviously involved with of, um, uh, families. Um, I, I tend to feel, I mean, reviewing the uh, literature on, on interventions, I mean, what, what we really need are simple, brief interventions that work. And I don't think we know at the moment what those best are. Uh, such that we can say the clinicians confident, you know, confidently, this is this is a, a good way to go. Um, uh, I, I mean, I tend to sort of favour problem-solving types of interventions, but the evidence again is not, you know, in terms of young people, it's not uh, really strong. And of course, those do demand time. I mean, I think, uh, and, and I talk about the evidence for the dialectical behaviour therapy, but the problem is you're talking there about fairly intensive treatment, three to four months at least, uh, group and individual uh, work, but of course, uh, doing it in groups is uh, provides some uh, economy in terms of time. I mean, I, th I, think, I think we've got to really move towards thinking more about prevention. And I really do think we've got to take this very seriously um, and uh, start trying to do it in schools, you know, using the evidence that's out there to try and develop uh, interventions that are preventive um, approaches which are, are going to show some benefits. I and mean, that, that, to me, is where the real need is. But I recognise that the impact on clinical services when people are actually youngsters are actually self-harming is, is enormous. Uh, and somebody commented last night that you know that self-harm is, is is taking a in a sense is taking a lot of resource away from other uh, problems, some of which may be more more serious in, in, in terms of impacts on young people and, and, and outcomes. Sorry it's not a very no. sorry, but it's, 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 Okay, I'm afraid there are lots more questions, but we've got to stop. We're out of time. Keith will be around uh, during the tea break for further questions, so thank you very much. To be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.